Coming up on this edition of the Next Man Up podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network, Kenny Rhoda and I talk about the Browns' 20-13 to loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh. We talk about what has gone wrong with the Freddie Kitchens Browns en route to 5-7, and seven, what the future may or may not hold for Freddie Kitchens, and other matters concerning the colossal disappointment of the 2019 Brown season. Welcome to the latest edition of the Next Man Up podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm Dennis Maniloff, along with co-host Kenny Rhoda, back at Studio Control, producer extraordinaire Chase Smith. Roadman, we come to the listeners, or we talk, before we give this over to the listeners, uh, several hours after the Browns' uh, ridiculous defeat to the Pittsburgh Steelers, 20-13 to 13 at Heinz Field on Sunday afternoon, December 1st. Um, I mean, w- what else can you say but a, a complete debacle Fitting of a season that is now five and seven with the record and no playoffs. I don't care what anybody says about a 0.23% chance of the second wild card. They're done. They're not making any playoffs. How could you ever expect the five and seven team to run the table anyway? Um, but it was just, you know, it's so frustrating on behalf of the Browns fans. I, I can feel the pain. I did the post game show on WTAM 1100 with Anthony Alford and, we got, you know, we had slam phone lines for three hours, just all sorts of frustration. And, um, you know, I, I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. I tried to warn you, Roadman. You did. You yeah. did, D-Man. And I, I had the Browns winning by three touchdowns. And when they were up 10 nothing, I'm like, here it comes. Finally, it's all going to come together. They're, they're putting it together after the, uh, the, the offensive explosion against the Miami Dolphins. It's 10 nothing. Chubb and, and Hunt, they're featuring uh, the two best running backs uh, on the same team in the entire NFL, and it's all going well, and then it fell apart. They wet the bed. They crapped the bed. They pissed down their leg. Uh, you, you name it, they did it. And give the Steelers and Mike Tomlin credit. I'm not a Tomlin guy, but Tomlin to have I that am. team at seven and five, to have them at seven and five with Duck Duck Goose at quarterback, Benny Snell at running back, James Washington at, at wide receiver, and no Marquise Pouncey on, on the offensive line. To have that team at seven and five, I tip my cap to him. I was wrong on the game. I was wrong on the Steelers, and uh, and you were right about the the Ravens too, D man. They beat. Uh, uh, San Francisco in a hard-fought game today uh, as well. So I'm done predicting NFL games for the 2019 season. I'm finished with the exception of this. The Browns aren't making the playoffs like you said. Stick a fork in them. Uh, they are done. Turn out the lights. The party's over. Finite. Fire Freddy. Get it over and done with and move on to your next coach and the next season. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly been a debacle at five and within the five and seven. The Cleveland Browns have lost to Brandon Allen in Denver, making his first NFL start, and <laughs> Devlin Hodges. What was this start number two of his NFL number career? Two. Yeah, I you know you just can't have that. Losing to one of those two guys is unacceptable. Losing to both is beyond unacceptable. If there is such a thing. Um, you know, where to begin when you think about the latest loss? Of course, you can start with what happened with Miles a couple weeks ago because the Browns being without Miles Garrett, it's a big loss. But as you said, with Pouncey out for the Steelers, that's a huge loss for them. And the Steelers are not going to sit here and entertain any uh, sympathy because, you know, on the Browns' part because they're missing well-documented, Roethlisberger basically for the entire season. They they were missing Juju Smith-Schuster for this game. They didn't have James Conner for this game. Those guys have been banged up for a while. So as many personnel shortages as the Browns had on defense, the Steelers had on offense, if not worse. And yet they were able to win 
uh, now 16 consecutive victories by the Steelers franchise over the Browns in Pittsburgh. Uh, but I'm thinking back when I when I think about the, the you know the seeds of this loss. To me, they're planted, of course, with the fact that the season wasn't going particularly well. You you have to look at the overarchings. You know, the the full body of work to that point hadn't been great, so that that played into it. But you also, to me, have such silliness. And yeah, I'm getting this out of the way early, and I don't care what anybody tells me about how I'm overstating this. Why in the world is Freddie Kitchens wearing a Pittsburgh started it t-shirt in a public setting? There's absolutely no reason for it. Now, did it, was it the reason the Browns lost? No. Was it, was it reason number 150? No. But there's absolutely no reason for the head coach of your team to be wearing that T-shirt in public in the week leading up to the game. And the Steelers players, some of them, at least to Castro and probably others, saying, yeah, they took notice of it and and they were fired up. Did they look fired up when the Browns were up 10-0? No. So you can't just say, well, the Steelers used that uh, T-shirt momentum to, to get a fast start. No, the Steelers did not use that momentum. But I'm simply saying that Kitchens wearing that T-shirt, even though he said he got it as a gag gift or whatever, you don't take that out of your residence. I don't care whether you think you're not going to get photographed or not. But what it is, is it's symptomatic of a franchise that is disheveled, disorganized, uh, dare we say, clueless at certain turn, in, in turns and whatnot. That's what this is. It's symptomatic of a franchise that just has dropped its compass in the locker room. You cannot have your head coach wearing that T-shirt in pub. No, you can't have, even at home, you can't have him wearing that T-shirt, period. Hey, he Gets it, great. Keep it, put it in the uh, in the drawer for later down the road and everything. You can look back on that time, maybe laugh with it. He can't be wary. You're trying to change the culture of the Browns, and your head coach is going out in public, whether he had a jacket over it or not, whether his daughters told him to wear it or not, and supposedly they did, so that's why he wore it. You can't wear that. You just can't. It's not the look you need for this organization that's trying to change the culture from the top on down, and, and I, I go back to when uh, Buddy Boy made this statement after hiring Freddie Kitchens, uh, John Dorsey. We hired him because he's a good leader of men. Is that a sign uh, of a good leader of men right there? That, that That's more like he wants to be one of the boys in the locker room. He wants to be one of, one of the players, one of the guys. You can't do that. you got to draw the line somewhere and, and set the standard. And, and Freddie Kitchens has failed to do that with that T-shirt. He's failed to do that throughout the entire year with discipline. And tell me why in the some uh, in the second half, Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt ran the ball a total of six times, D-man. They well, ran the ball six times the entire second half with their two best players who averaged five yards a carry in the first half. To me, yeah. it goes to the X's and O's as much as it does the, the T-shirt. There's no question about it. And as I said, the T-shirt did not cost the Browns the game. It is symptomatic of this organization, this franchise, this coach. But before we get into what you were just talking about, the X's and O's of the Steelers-Browns game part two, I want to go to one other thing that occurred before the game, the mysterious, if you will, suspension or leaving home of Demarius Randall. Now, it, ha- it has been done before by right. head coaches of NFL teams, college teams, that players are left home. They don't make trips. Why in the world Demarius Randall was not playing for the Cleveland Browns today, to me, is a question that needs to be asked and has been, but it requires more than just a verbal punt by Freddie Kitchens. He owe, Yes, he does owe it to the shareholders. And who are the shareholders in this case? They are the fans. 
not the media, but the fans, the media being the mouthpiece, being the conduit, but the fans who pay their hard-earned money to watch this team, either in person or on TV or whatever else, other streaming device, the fans of this town deserve answers to questions such as, why was Demarius Randall not playing today? Now, again, I saw it on Twitter. Oh, the head coach, the team doesn't know anybody anything. Well, yes, he does. Because the fans are sitting there going, the season's on the line, and a pretty darn good defensive player was not playing, not because he was injured, but because he was, again, suspended. Is that the word to use? Left home for whatever. So I, I was frustrated, number one, that Demarius Randall wasn't there. Number two, that we get no explanation as to why he wasn't there because this is a very public uh, sport here. This is not some – and I know other coaches haven't necessarily said why they suspend a guy. But once again, you have this bizarro world situation with Demarius Randall, and we're left to wonder what in the world happened. I have no answer for you on that, D-Man, with Mr. Cesarone. Maybe his Cesarone was too high for Freddie and they got into an argument or something. I don't know. I have no idea. I do remember the last time these two teams played, he was, uh, uh, you know, the helmet-to-helmet hit, right, with Demarius, and he was ejected, correct? Am I, am I remembering that right? He was ejected from the game the first yes. time they played? Okay, yes. so I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know. I'm not sure. Did he miss practice? Did he miss curfew? Uh, did he talk back to the coach? Uh, was was I, I, we don't know. And that's a great uh, you know point by you. A- at least give the shareholders, the season ticket holders, right, and the fans uh, a reason why one of your best defensive players, along with the guy that's already suspended, your best defensive player, isn't going to be in this game today when the season was on the line. Okay, now if he did something that broke a team rule, that's fine. But tell us that. Don't just say that I'm, I'm going to keep that between me and Demarius. No, you he broke a team rule, okay? And that's all we're going to say about it, and that's why he was suspended for today. He didn't even come out and say that. This, this team has just been uh, a roller coaster of, uh, you know, mistake after mistake after mistake sprinkled in with a little success here and there, twists and turns. It's been a soap opera. For, and and let, you know what? Let me let me go here, too. All right, D-Man, now that I'm thinking about it. James Washington, four catches for 111 yards and a touchdown today. Uh, let's see here. Who else? Uh, Vance McDonald, their tight end, who uh, is one of their better players, three catches. How can James Washington get open for four uh, catches and 111 yards and a touchdown? But the greatest wide receiver uh, the next to Jerry Rice in the history of the game can't get open and impact the game in Odell Beckham Jr. How, how is that possible that they are unable to get the ball to Odell Beckham Jr.? Can, can you answer that for me, Dean? I mean, when they got him in the trade, this was supposed to put them over the top. I bought into the hype and everything. That, that fan was screaming, we got Odell, we got Odell. Everybody's losing their mind. And they can't get him the ball, but yet a James Washington from a fourth string quarterback when camp started for Pittsburgh and uh, uh, training camp, Duck Duck Goose can get him the ball for four catches, 111 yards and a touchdown and Odell Beckham Jr. three catches for 29 yards. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that road, man, because I think back to Thursday night, the beginning of uh, week 13, Thursday afternoon. You had uh, Cleveland Browns training camp quarterback David Blau starting uh, in place of Jeff Driscoll, who was injured, Driscoll having started in place of Matthew Stafford. You see Blau go up top to Galladay on the first pass he threw for 75 yards and a touchdown. So David Blau managed to hit Kenny Galladay for a bomb. You see Devlin Hodges. Throwing, uh, you know, 40 plus in the air to James Washington. And yet the longest pass play in, you know, total yards, I believe, not even air yards, but pass yards by the Browns today or earlier today was, I think, 23 yards. Yep. And 
uh, once again, Odell Beckham Jr., a non-factor. And you say, oh, you look at his overall season and he's chugging along to a thousand yard season. Ah, whatever. This guy has been, he just hasn't been Odell Beckham Jr., the guy that we were, you know, we were sold. And you think about the conglomerate trade, that massive trade, when you when you put everybody in the same kettle, they essentially, I think officially call it one gigantic blockbuster. Right. And the two main pieces, when the, the trade between the Giants and the Browns, the two main pieces the Browns got were Olivier Vernon, the edge rusher, and Odell Beckham Jr., the wide receiver. And we were told, we were sold, that these two guys are game changers. They're impact players. Well, I mean, you've seen, you've watched this season. Olivier Vernon, yeah, he's banged up now, but even when he was healthy, he was barely impacting anything, okay? And Odell Beckham Jr., yeah, he's put up some numbers uh, overall, and yes, he fattened up on the terrible Jets, but you're telling me, and nobody's going to sit here with a straight face and say Odell Beckham Jr. has impacted games anywhere close to the level he was supposed to. So as of right now, that trade is not a good one. I wouldn't call it a, a disaster, but it's certainly not a good one because these two impact players or so-called impact players just haven't delivered. Then that, that leads you to wonder, okay, where does the blame lie? Where is the culpability? And I'm not one of those guys who always falls back on blaming the coach. I think it's lazy. I think it's too easy. But – Certainly where the Odell Beckham Jr. situation is concerned, Kitchens has to have some culpability in this. Uh, what percentage? Only the Browns know. And that leads me to this. When John Dorsey evaluates at the end of the year, he's got to sit there among the bazillion questions he has for Freddie Kitchens, if he so chooses to retain Kitchens, is – what are you going to do to fix the Odell Beckham Jr. situation? That's one of, again, so many questions that John Dorsey must have for Freddie Kitchens. Maybe he's already asked some of them, but I would think in the postseason interview, not playoff season, but postseason interview, hey, Freddie, what in the world was going on with Odell Beckham Jr. this year? I'm with you, D-Man, 100%. 100% on that. And I just – I'm looking at the box score. If I would have told you before the game, D-Man, okay, if I would have told you that um, Duck Duck Goose was going to throw for more yards than Baker Mayfield, that Benny Snell Jr. was going to run for more yards than Nick Chubb, and that James Washington was going to catch passes for more yards than Odell Beckham Jr., you would have thought I was crazy, right? Well, that's what happened today. That's what happened. A Steelers offense that had scored four touchdowns in its last 54 offensive possessions, okay? Four out of 54. That means 50 other times they didn't score a touchdown. They go two for eight or two for nine today uh, against the Browns, scoring touchdowns with Duck Duck Goose uh, at quarterback and those other guys that I named on offense. It, it was just a, a monumental collapse from a 10 nothing lead, total control of the game. And to me, it goes back. And you say, uh, you know, it's not fair to put it all on the head coach. I'm sorry I disagree with you in this case. For me, it, it's Freddie Kitchens. It's whoop the hell It's on him not having this team prepared, not uh, putting this team in the best position to win. Your quarterback hurts his hand at halftime, and you have the two best running backs as far as a tandem in the NFL, and you run it six times in the second half when, when, when your quarterback, I guess, got shot up and had to wear a glove for the first time ever in maybe his entire career, and you've got those two running backs back there, and your O-line blocks better uh, with the run than it does against the pass with your starting left tackle out. That goes back to coaching. It's stupid, and it falls on Freddie Kitchens. Yeah, and don't – confuse this when I say that you know I think it's lazy to blame it all on the coach I am not by any means saying that the 2019 season to this point and basically the fact that they don't make the playoffs regardless of how they finish because I don't want this fool's gold potential uh, where they suddenly win their last fall although they're not beating the Ravens I don't care 
Uh, that's one guaranteed loss out of the last four. But um, And who knows about the Bengals because they just got done uh, demolishing the Jets for their first victory. But just because I say that you, it's lazy to blame the coach doesn't mean that there isn't culpability for Kitchens. And I totally understand. I would totally get where, where if at the end of the season, John Dorsey says, you know what, Freddie? We took a chance on you. We like you as a person. We think you have a, a decent mind to call plays, but we're moving on uh, to the next guy uh, as head coach of this team. I would totally understand that because smarter people than I have all have said in the, in the league that if you are uncertain in the slightest about your quarterback or your head coach, you move on. You don't dig in and say, well, it'll be fine in three years. It'll be fine in four years. Those two positions, the quarterback and the head coach, are two inextricably linked to success in the NFL to afford to just sit there and ride it out until, they, until it clicks. So if John Dorsey, when the season's done, or if, if he hasn't already, is not comfortable with Freddie Kitchens in 2020 – and it doesn't matter that Freddie's only had one year. You move on. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Browns move on from Kitchens because this season has been a colossal disappointment. And I don't care. I don't want to hear all oh, the injuries. You don't understand the injuries. Blah, 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 blah. Every team has injuries. You know what? The, pit, uh, the, the, the Browns going into Heinz Field had relatively healthy. Baker Mayfield, Odell Beckham Jr., Jarvis Landry, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt. That quintet right there should have been enough to win you that game. So I don't want to hear all the you, – you don't realize what they were missing on defense and all their line was re you know recalibrated and they had you know guys in the secondary missing. Bottom line, you had five relatively healthy skill position players – who are supposed to be able to set the world on fire, and you couldn't beat the uh, Devlin Hodges Steelers this Sunday with your season on the line. That is a huge problem, period. So, D-Men, it's time to start looking at the draft. Offensive line, obviously, Chris Hubbard sucks at right tackle. Um, uh, you know, what's the who was it that was out today the left tackle I'm having a brain fart Greg right Robinson now. Greg Robinson thank you uh Greg Robinson do you bring him back at left tackle after an up and down year but you 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 saw how much they missed him today when he wasn't in there because of a concussion uh there, there are you know what for a team that I thought was going to win the division uh, because on paper they had more talent than anybody in the division uh, there are a lot of holes for John Dorsey uh, to fix and the honeymoon's over for John Dorsey now uh, he's got a decision on his head coach, uh, and, and he's got a decision uh, he has to make with the offensive line, as well as Odell Beckham Jr. Do you do you potentially consider trading Odell Beckham Jr. here uh, this offseason? That's something I think John Dorsey, if he gets calls on, he has to seriously consider that because uh, this guy has not impacted the season the way he should have. And then on defense, you, you need to make some changes as well. So, uh, you know, Five and seven right now, four games left. Uh, maybe they finish eight and eight. That's a half game better than they were last year. So that's minor progress, but not enough for me to bring back Freddie Kitchens uh, and keep this roster intact the way it is. Yeah, and, you know, when you think about the disappointment of five and seven in a vacuum, it's bad enough. But then you look at the division and the fact that the Pittsburgh Steelers, with all their injuries to key guys, are seven and five and in the second wild card spot as we speak is that much more painful. And on top of that, you have to look at the reality of that is the Baltimore Ravens. Okay. Week four, Browns go into Baltimore. It's obviously the high water mark of Freddie Kitchen's career. He boat races Lamar Jackson and the Ravens. Both teams go out and leave that game at two and two. Browns have the tiebreaker because they have the head to head. Since that game, the Baltimore Ravens are undefeated. How about that? Okay. How they have that? not been beaten. And they're trucking teams. They're also winning close games as they did today against a very formidable 49ers team, which, by the way, 
blasted the Browns into Bolivian, as Mike Tyson used to say, uh, when the Browns <laughs> played them a few weeks ago in Santa Clara. So the Ravens are winning every which way. Um, I think today I saw where Lamar Jackson only threw for like a buck five or buck ten, and he ran for a hundred. I mean, they just do whatever it takes to win. They're nasty, and honestly, they are the best team certainly in the AFC, and I'd make a case for them being the best team in the in the NFL at this moment because on the in the background, as I'm talking to you, Kenny, and, and, and Chase is listening, I'm watching the Houston Texans taking it to Belichick and the Patriots. Uh, the Patriots are going to be have two losses and will be tied with the page or the Ravens at 10 and two, but of yep. course the Ravens have the tiebreaker because they won the head to head meeting. So right now, I mean, after this game is over and it's going to be over, you know, with a Houston victory, the number one seed in the AFC will be the, the Baltimore Ravens. So, um, you know, the fact that the Ravens are in the Browns division, the fact that, only a few months ago, it seems, we were told, oh, Lamar Jackson, he's just a uh, – he's a runner. He can't I was run. wrong. He, he's a gimmick. He's a gimmick. That's all. I was wrong, D-Man. You know, and, and, and the Browns had Baker Mayfield, the number one overall pick, and Ben Roethlisberger was on the backside of his career, and you wouldn't have to worry about the Steelers anymore. Well, now all of a sudden, the only team you're in front of is the Bengals, and – the Steelers have beaten you by two games through 12 with who knows what at the skill position. Right. And the leader in the, in the division, who's going to say that that team, the Ravens is going away in the next five to seven years, if not longer, who, who's going to say that it, it, it's not some over the hill gang. It's not a bunch of 35 year olds barely hanging on. It's a, it's a lot of young guys with some veterans mixed in. So, the Ravens have a right to say, you know what? We're just getting started. And they happen to be in the Browns division. So that makes it that much more depressing or, you know, frustrating uh, to recognize that the Ravens are having the season they're having and the Steelers are somehow ahead of you by two games. And, and then you have to read a tweet from a national reporter today where the Steelers players were crediting Mike Tomlin with, quote, saving the game because yep. of the adjustments he made at halftime. Well, you know what? I mean, pour more salt in the wound. D-Man, uh, like I said, I'm not a Tomlin guy, but this may be one of his better coaching jobs based on, on what they, they've done. His best move to date was benching Mason Rudolph last week against the Bengals. If he doesn't bench Mason Rudolph, they lose to Cincinnati. And if he starts Ru Rudolph today – the, the Browns win that game. The fact he he benched Mason Rudolph and went with Duck Duck Goose uh, is the reason why they won last week and they won today. And so that again, I I I, I call out coaches when I think uh, they make mistakes, but I also give them credit when they're deserving of it. And Mike Tomlin's deserving of last week and this week for saving uh, the Steelers' season as far as at least uh, being uh, you know in the playoff picture right now at seven and five. Yeah, Roadman, and I want to go back to the Steelers game specifically, but also in doing so, it, it is a it's been a theme throughout the season with the Freddie Kitchens play calling and the Freddie oh. Kitchens adjustments or lack thereof. <laughs> you had the case where the Browns take the ten nothing lead. They're, you're feeling good because you know that the Steelers are going to be offensively challenged, and yet somehow the Steelers rip off twenty unanswered before the Browns score the final three of the game to make it 20 to 13. But here's the issue. And some of the callers were bringing this up in the, in the post game show today on WTAM. It's not that the Browns have had trouble starting games. It's not that they're ill prepared going into the game for the most part, because you've seen mm -hmm. this team play reasonably well at the outset of the game including these, you know, the touchdowns or field goals on the first drive. The problem with Freddie Kitchens Browns has been as the game goes on, as the game moves off script, Freddie Kitchens as head coach and play caller doesn't seem to 
evolve with the game, doesn't seem to make the necessary adjustments, loses track of touches for certain guys or game situations that mandate uh, runs, you know, when they and he passes when he should run or he runs when he should pass. That seems to be more of the problem is the in-game stuff even more so than the preparation because Kitchens can say, and and he did, my wearing the T-shirt in public in, during the week did not affect the outset of the game, did not affect us at all, and it certainly didn't affect the way we started. And he's right because the Browns started 10-0. and 0. As I said, that was symptomatic, not the cause. But during the game, as the game moves on, and certainly coming out of uh, halftime, it appears as though Freddie Kitchens has had trouble, not appears, he has had trouble figuring out what the other team is doing and adjusting accordingly. He's not a good X's and O's guy, D-Man. And, and you know what that goes back to? He's never done it before. He's learning on the job at the NFL level. This is his first ever head coaching job. He's been an offensive coach. He's worked with running backs. He's worked with uh, wide receivers and quarterbacks. And, and last year he got to call plays for eight games. And all of a sudden he's got to handle the offense, the defense, the special teams. He's got to throw discipline. The, the, the discipline. He's got to throw the, the challenge flag. He's got to make halftime adjustments, in-game adjustments. I mean, he is not suited to be a head coach, and I can't see how with the, the talent that you have on this roster and some of the veteran players that are on this roster, how you can bring him back next year and have him learn uh, on the job again for a second year while you're trying to uh, make the playoffs and, and uh, become a championship contender. I just can't see it. I, I've got to have a veteran head coach running this team next year and, and Mike McCarthy's up there and I haven't looked yet because uh, well I, I thought the Browns were going to win today and uh, we wouldn't even be discussing this so part of my research now is the draft and what head coaches with uh, championship experience are out there and off the top of my head uh, Mike McCarthy is the first guy that comes to mind well and, and another candidate uh, potentially if kitchens were to be let go at the end of the year it would be greg roman that was brought that name was brought up by uh my co-host anthony alford uh, granted roman doesn't have uh, the nfl head coaching experience but he's done a terrific job with a, an assortment of quarterbacks he oh by the way happens to be the oc of the baltimore ravens so you'd uh, potentially rob rob them uh, of one of their uh, brighter minds so uh, you know we can't I mean we could throw Roman out there we could throw McCarthy whether he's available or not um, we well yeah we still don't know it, right will kitchens be retained and I, you and I both said we wouldn't be surprised at all if Dorsey moves off of it now well, yeah here's the thing if John Dorsey says you know you guys are all off base here any of you people who think that we are going to uh, bail on Freddie Kitchens after one year. You're crazy. He's a great coach in waiting. He just needed to go through a year of learning. Okay, well, if that's what he's going to believe, then he's seeing things that we're not seeing about Freddie Kitchens in 2020 and beyond. But I'm going to say this, Roadman. Good. Regardless of whether Dorsey makes the change or he retains Kitchens, the players themselves have to look in the mirror and go, you know what? This was ridiculous. What we put out there as a we, as a collective, right. was unacceptable on so many levels. And it's been said of the 2019 Browns, a collection of individuals as opposed to a team. Yep. And I'm, I'm not going to argue with that point at all. Now, I'm not in the locker room. I don't see them on a daily basis. Maybe they're the tightest team I've ever seen, you know, we've ever known. But it certainly doesn't seem like this is a team as much as it is a collection of individuals. And the only way that you are going to have success in the NFL, let alone sustain success, is if you are a team. If everybody's buying in to the collective, and you don't have individuals off doing their own things 
trying to figure out their own identities and creating their own brands or whatnot. And so it's not just the coaching that is at issue here. It is the players who have underperformed woefully, who've been embarrassed on the national stage, on national TV, um, you know, prime time, you, you name it. They, they've been uh, trucked. They've had em- embarrassing penalties, stupid, uh, you know, personal fouls and all kinds of stuff. So it's not just the coaches. And even John Dorsey and his staff, as we talked about, he can't be the Teflon Don anymore. He's got to look at himself in the mirror and go, am I doing the job the way I need to do it? Because there's got to be some culpability with John Dorsey for five and seven as well. Uh, your individualism stuff, D-Man, I think is right on the money. And I'm going to give you an example, all right? Friday night, we did a game. You were doing it for Cleveland.com. I was doing it for WHBC. We did a high school game between Maslin and Avon. And I told you before the game, watch out for Maslin's two wide receivers, uh, Wilson Lamp on one side um, and, and Ballard on the other. Both are Division One talents. Uh, Jaden Ballard's going to Ohio State. They have the Stark County Player of the Year at quarterback uh, in, in Aiden Longwell, right? So watch out for them exploding today. Well, guess what? The coach thought it would be better to run the ball against Avon. That's the way to beat Avon. And so they handed the ball to Zion Pfeiffer, I think, 26 times or whatever it was, for 146 yards and four touchdowns. And those two wide receivers didn't care because their team won the football game. They were fine with it. They were high-fiving the offensive line. They were high-fiving Zion Pfeiffer, the senior running back, because all they wanted to do was win. And with the Browns, it doesn't seem like that is the most important thing to some of these guys. And Odell Beckham Jr. comes to the forefront when we talk about this. It's about his brand and his clown cleats and his visor and this and that. And now we see maybe why New York uh, couldn't wait to trade him and get a first-round pick for him. Uh, Baker's doing progressive commercials and the Heisman House commercials, and, and he's doing Hulu has live sports and all this. Where are your priorities? With Maslin, it's winning their first ever state championship in the playoff era. They don't care who gets the credit. With the Browns, it seems like it's more about who gets the credit rather than just winning. Well, and I'll take you to, from Maslin to the college level. Look at the Ohio State Buckeyes. I mean, look at how the Buckeyes are run by Ryan Day and how professional, to use that word, uh, you know, they look, even though they are a college team, right? They, they look like a mini professional team, the way they operate uh, this past weekend, they go into the big house. They don't get caught up in all the craziness and all the chippiness and all the interactions with fans and stuff. Yeah. There was a little pregame dust up, but once the game started, the players just had their heads down. It was a business trip. You saw guys like Dobbins going into the end zone, handing the ball to the officials. Uh, and they did their business, and they did it well, and they got out of there, and they're dominant, okay? But you see how well run the Ohio State yep. Buckeyes are, and you sit there and you go, well, gee, why can't that happen, uh, you know, with the with the professional team here in Cleveland, the Browns? And I know there's a different set of challenges and all that stuff, but y- y- your eyes don't lie. You know, right, there's right. a point where your eyes don't lie. And what we have seen – on television or if you've been down there at the stadium in person, you have seen a team that just hasn't been able to put it together. And I said long ago, Roadman, I'm tired of hearing about how much talent the Browns have. I guess I'll bring it up now because to me, it is a factor in the five and seven. Meaning, if you start this season with the understanding that it is a rebuild. I, I give you the Arizona Cardinals. Okay. Not much was expected of the Arizona Cardinals right. outside of their walls. They had Kingsbury as their head coach. They had Kyler Murray, admittedly a number one overall pick, but he was a rookie. He is a rookie. But when people looked at the Arizona Cardinals, they didn't expect much. And it's been up and down for the Cardinals, mostly down. They got trucked today by the Rams, but you know what? They scratched out three wins so far, and they've been entertaining in, in, in certain games. They've actually played the Ravens pretty close in Baltimore, which surprised me. Uh, they've had other competitive losses. But it's one thing to stomach 
a sub 500 record and no playoffs when the expectations are as limited as they were for the Cardinals. It's quite another when you are told all off season how great this roster of the Cleveland Browns is, right. how much talent is just oozing out of the building. And everywhere you look, there's players who are going to light the world on fire. And oh, by the way, coming in half a season is going to be Kareem Hunt to add to the embarrassment of riches. And then you go to the defensive line and it's going to be a lakefront four. And these guys are going to yeah. wreak havoc. Well, you know what? I'd rather have linebackers like TJ Watt who wreck havoc in the backfield than a supposed defensive line that's going to cause some, some trouble. I mean, I want to see when is the next Cleveland Browns linebacker who makes plays in the backfield, either by disrupting the running game at the point of attack or sacking the quarterback or hurrying the quarterback. Edge rushers, okay, it's great to have them. But where are the Browns' impact linebackers? At least one who resembles a T.J. Watt, who can fly off the edge and create all kinds of craziness. Because, listen, I get that Joe Schobert's having a solid to good year, and he's a PFF darling, and he's had a lot of picks for a linebacker. But I want the Browns linebackers to make plays on the other side. Now you say, well, with a 4-3, how are they supposed to do that? I don't know. I just want edge rushers in addition to Miles Garrett who are disrupting the game. And I see it with the Steelers all the time with their linebacking core. They're living in the backfield. And I, I want to see that from the Browns going forward somewhere, somehow. Well, that's on John Dorsey this offseason with the money they have to spend salary uh, cap-wise as well as in the draft. What does he do to, to address that? They've got to put their priorities uh, in order. What is it? Is it left tackle? Is it uh, the offensive line first? Is it linebacker that you just talked about? Uh, is it... Uh, you know, uh, more help on the defensive line after thinking this defensive line was going to be uh, all that in a bag of chips. So uh, it's just a very frustrating season. Thank God for the Buckeyes who are playing Wisconsin Saturday in Indianapolis. We get to see a, a well-run organization, a, a football team that has five-star talent just like the Browns do, but their talent actually lives up to the expectations. So uh, you know what? Uh, these final four games, some guys are playing for their jobs for next year, uh, and uh, I think the head coach is coaching for his job for next year. I'll leave it at that. All right, Roadman. Thank you very much uh, for taking the time on this uh, Monday, Sunday night uh, to talk over Brown Steelers. Once again, Browns lose in Pittsburgh 20-13. to 13. Uh, Playoff hopes are dashed. Whatever slim ones there were are gone. Uh, at five and seven, they're they're just playing out the string in these final four, and uh, you know uh, we will be joining you again after another Browns game. But uh, unfortunately, the relevancy of this season has uh, dissipated. Uh, thanks again, Roadman, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. 